So we just had a, a, a manuscript published in 2018 uh, that maybe at the time of the second surgery, uh, after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, that we should use heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy high pack. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that study, Shannon. Sure, so you're talking about the Van Drouw study, mm -hmm. which was just published in 2018 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this was an interesting study where they took patients that had been deemed unresectable, that were going to get neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and then they randomized them. If the, if the patient had a response, or at least stable disease after three cycles of standard taxol and carboplatin, they were randomized to either receive heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy with cisplatin, um, or just to have regular surgery followed by three additional cycles. So all patients received another three cycles IV after the completion of their surgery. And there were about 245 patients that were randomized. And what they found were improved progression-free survival, so about four months improved progression-free survival in the patients that got high pec at the time of their debulking surgery, as well as improved overall survival, yielding about 11 month improvement in overall survival for 45 months overall survival in those patients that got high pec. However, there were some setbacks, so the, there were more, um, although they said the toxicity and the complications were about the same, when you looked and kind of dug in on some of the surgical outcomes, almost 70% or I think 72% of the patients had a colostomy or an ileostomy. In both groups? In the group that got high pack. It's weird, huh? Yeah, it's weird, and they, it wasn't something that was mandated, and they don't really have a good explanation for it. They thought it might be just surgeon choice, like, hey, I gave this patient high pec, I did a bowel resection, I'm gonna go ahead and bring up an ileostomy for protection, um, but they don't really know kind of why that was. But certainly, you know, when we're talking about neoadjuvant and reducing the need for bowel resections, reducing ileostomies, reducing colostomies, and now we're adding high pec and potentially increasing those things, and I think it's also important when you look, the progression-free survival of 14 months. 10 not, versus 14, yeah, four months 10, PFS. Four month PFS, and, when, and I know we don't do cross-trial comparisons, but when we look at those four, you know, the 14 months, that's not all that different from some of our other studies that looked at suboptimal patient populations with weekly, you know, with dose-dense chemo or the addition of bevacizumab. So I think what you said is there's no way to do a blinded surgical study. That's right. And once you begin to do a blinded surgical or interperitoneal study like this, systematic biases are introduced. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, and you also have a European trial here, and, and, and they do wonderful trials in Europe. It's a different uh, post-operative management. Their average length of stay was eight to nine days in both groups. That's right. Our average length of stay after surgery like this would be three or four days. Right. So in those, uh, to say there's no difference in the surgical uh, complications, those who have done high pec clearly the bowel dysfunction, the prolonged post-operative uh, uh, ileus is much higher uh, in the high pec arm, which is not identified in this case because they're in the hospital for so long. Yeah, so it's controversial. This particular study at ASCO in 2017 did not even get an oral, not even a poster discussion, it was a poster. Mm -hmm. But the New England Journal thought it was publication worthy. So clearly that illustrates the, the controversy. So. It, 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 in Boston or St. Louis, you guys do in high pack? So, so our surgeons are, are, are starting to think about doing this. Um, mm -hmm. And again, it's gonna be a highly selected patient population. Um, I think the, the results are intriguing. Yes. Um, so, so at least one of our surgeons is, is starting to uh, you know, select patients uh, mm -hmm. to do it. How about you, Matt? You know, we have a long-term program that we've had that mostly in our mucinous tumors, of course, which uh, I think We've, it's taken a while to establish a standard within that field of, uh, of uh, peritoneal mucinous-based tumors. The controversy on this trial is, one, the side effects in the manuscript are really quite surprisingly low. The, the issue with this ostomy issue is it's a little tricky to figure out from the paper because it's actually the patients that had bowel resection of some type that protective ostomy was much more. So there was a lot of patients that didn't need bowel resection as part of their debulking surgery. They're not included in that 72% number. So don't, don't take it away that every, you know, every patient, you know, 72% of all the patients that had IPEC had an ostomy. That's actually not the case. It's, it's much lower than that. Um, the, the issue with us developing a program, patients are asking for it, we're thinking about it, we're in the same boat. We're, yep. we're not quite there as far as doing it routine. We still think these patients probably should be on a research protocol, okay. at least for your mm -hmm. capturing these side effects. Yep. Are we gonna do as well 
at a lower volume center than, than an area that's yeah. been doing it for 10 years. I think these are very important things to help protect our patients. We, we, we looked at it uh, in Phoenix. We actually had it at the Journal Club, which was fun. And we decided not to do it. Uh, we think that it's still investigational. We think you have to look at the totality of the data. And, and you probably have heard me say it takes two trials to convince anyone of anything. And well, I'll say that again as we talk about other uh, uh, modalities that are not substantiated by two trials. But, 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 I think yeah. that, but I think that, you know, there have been several trials of intraperitoneal chemotherapy, um, many of which have been positive for overall survival. So I think this trial, it's not surprising that there was an overall yeah. survival improvement, especially with using cisplatin chemotherapy, you know, based upon 172 and the two trials uh, performed by the GOG beforehand. I mean, it was seven cycles though versus six. Yep, true. So, yep. you know, the only trial to isolate the effect, one question, intraperitoneal chemotherapy, as you know, 252 was negative. Every other trial like this one introduces other factors, differences in surgery, differences in dose, differences in mm -hmm. schedule. So mm -hmm. this controversy will continue. Yeah, yeah but Brad, we had five it. versus 10, we had yeah. six versus yeah. 12. <laughs> I don't think yeah, you'd do exactly. six versus seven, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, let's, but in summary here, yeah. th this is, in, from my reading of this paper and our own journal club discussion in Ohio State, we also don't think this is ready for prime time. This needs to be done on okay. prospective evaluation. Mm -hmm. And these patients, we have to do it on clinical trial. And that's going to take away from the other seven or eight very exciting clinical trials we have. With checkpoint inhibitors and PARP inhibitors. Inhibitors and combinations. Okay. Yeah.